One of the most, I think one of the most important findings in neuroscience in the last hundred years is that pleasure and pain are co-located, by which I mean that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of the balance. So when we do something that's pleasurable or reinforcing or rewarding, that balance tips to the side of pleasure. When we experience something painful, like cutting our finger, it tips to the side of pain. But one of the overarching rules governing this balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long, either to pleasure or pain. And the, the brain will work very hard to restore a level balance, or what neuroscientists call homeostasis, and that any deviation from neutrality is actually a form of stress. And that's really, that's the key. The problem with modern life, and one of the main problems with modern life, is that we have too many pleasurable substances and behaviors, and that is actually stressing us out. And so when we do something just obviously pleasurable, like having a beer or playing a video game or eating a piece of chocolate, it depends who you are because people are different, but in general those things are pleasurable to many people. What we do is we get a little um, tilt to the pleasure side and we get the release of dopamine in our brain's reward pathway, which is this evolutionarily, phylogenetically conserved, very, very old part of the brain that's been unchanged in our brains for just millennia and is also identical in other species all the way down to the lizard, which is why it's sometimes called the lizard brain. Our evolution meant that we've piled a whole bunch of other layers on top, but that part is exactly the same as it's always been. And it's the part that gets us again to approach pleasure and avoid pain. But here's really the key. The way that the brain restores a level balance or homeostasis after this deviation to the pleasure side is to not just bring it level again, but tilt it an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that's called the opponent process reaction. And I sort of think of that as these little gremlins that represent neuroadaptation, hopping on the pain side of the balance, but they like it on the balance, so they stay on until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount. That's that moment of wanting just one more video game, you know, another beer, another piece of chocolate. If we wait, the gremlins hop off, that feeling passes, and homeostasis is restored. It's really important because it's fundamental to the resilience of this system. But let's look at what happens if we, instead of waiting for those gremlins to hop off, instead immediately reach for another beer, another piece of chocolate, another video game. Another major rule of this balance is that with repeated exposure to the same or similar stimuli, that initial response gets weaker and shorter in duration, and the after response gets stronger and longer. So again, so we need stronger gremlins, right? And essentially what's happening in the brain, by the way, with those, with those neuroadaptation gremlins, is that we're down-regulating our own dopamine transmission. But again, what ends up happening is now that opponent process reaction is stronger and longer. So we go from, you know, shorter and weaker to stronger and longer on the pain side of the balance. And that is the fundamental sort of paradox or vicious cycle that we get into, especially when we're living in a world in which we have nearly universal ubiquitous access to highly potent, highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, which don't just release a little bit of dopamine, but a whole huge bolus. And we're all surrounded by them all the time, every day. And over time, what that means is that we're bombarding our dopamine reward pathway with way more dopamine than our primitive brains can handle. And the result is that we end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room. And they are now camped out there. And that's called allostasis. So allostasis is where our body has to accommodate and work very, very hard to try to restore homeostasis. And if it's unable to do that using the normal mechanisms, it essentially changes our set point. Our balance is easier to tip it to the side of pain, and it's really, really hard now to experience pleasure. And when we're not using, we're in a state of anxiety, universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria and craving for our drug. And so this is the fundamental problem. If you look at rates of depression and anxiety all over the world today, they are going up. Skyrocketing. Skyrocketing, suicide rates too. Also physical pain. The richest countries in the world are the countries that have the most suicide 
anxiety, depression, and physical pain. And this is by many different measures, many different survey measures, many different types of studies. So clearly we have something very strange going on here where the more we have of the kinds of you know, ideal things that we think would make a good life, lots of food, lots of fun stuff, lots of medicines to protect us from you know, illness and pain, we've clearly reached some kind of tipping point where we're now essentially more miserable than ever. And the question is why? I do think that the pleasure pain balance explains that. Because our primitive brains were not wired for an easy, hyper convenient world, we are suffering as a result of all of this access to these feel-good things. The first thing that we need to do is to cut out all of these feel-good substances and behaviors, at least for long enough for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off and for homeostasis to be restored. Dopamine fasting. Yeah, essentially dopamine fasting, right? And whatever your source of dopamine is, to cut it out for long enough. Now, in my clinical experience, in my practice, because I have patients who come in seeking help for anxiety, depression, insomnia. And the first thing that I will typically do is to have them cut out their feel-good drugs and behaviors. Very counterintuitive, right? As soon as you do take the, the weight off the pleasure side, you're gonna get this balance yep. slamming to the side of pain because now you've accumulated all these gremlins, right? But if you wait long enough without using, they eventually do hop off. In my clinical practice, it takes a minimum of a month abstaining for that to happen. And this is really the beauty of this intervention is that she herself gathered data and realized, first of all, she realized in the first two weeks she felt horrific. And, you know, she had no, and she realized that was her realization. Oh my goodness, I was really addicted. Like I hadn't realized I was, but that physiologic response when she stopped was a wake up call for her. And then when she got to four weeks, she just felt so much better, you know, less depression, less anxiety, more time to do other things, more enjoyment in other things. And then she herself was motivated.